It's nefarious, man. Like the brain works in fucked up ways. The mind is one of the most deceiving, manipulative pieces of equipment, flesh, human bodies on earth. I never have trusted my brain. All of that weight lives in your head. And you are the decision maker. Psychology of entrepreneurship. Hi, it's Ronsley. If this is your first volume, welcome. This is a weekly series where I go inside the mind of an entrepreneur, artist, athlete, academic to decipher what is the psychology of our decisions. Happy New Year, everybody, and thank you for my Christmas presents. You know, because in the last volume, I asked you to share this with your friends for Christmas as like my, you know, Christmas present. Um, anyway, I'm actually scripting this on the 18th of December, almost a whole month before it goes live. I can't tell you the sense of accomplishment I feel as a result. The accomplishment comes from having this amazing bunch of humans who are part of the team here and must amplify. They put so much into their work and I'm blessed to be able to lead them. But enough about me. You know I've been talking about my next guest from volume one when I spoke to this person. Society doesn't reward us with emotion. It rewards us based on intellect and what is perceived as to be successful. And a lot of us are focusing and obsessing about living in the now. I don't want to fucking live in the now if my now is shit. That was Philip McKinnon. And you remember how I interviewed Philip and attended his two-day Brave Mind event? Well, at that event, I met... I'm Mike Brown, and I started an oil and gas company, which I am currently in the process of leaving <laughs> to go do something else. He talks about oil and gas company and you, if I've been lucky enough to have your years since the beginning, might be thinking, Ronsley, dude, you never spoke about any oil and gas company person. Yeah, I didn't. You're right. But I did speak about interviewing a jet fighter pilot. I was a big reader when I was young and I knew a couple things from an early age. Uh, one, I read Patriot Games uh, by Tom Clancy when I was in third grade. And so I wanted, to, <laughs> I wanted to be Jack Ryan. I wanted to go to the Naval Academy. So I oriented my life around going to the Naval Academy because, because that was my goal. And so when I got the acceptance letter to the Academy junior year, like that, I remember very distinctly that being a huge win because I, that was the first time I had really worked for many years on one singular goal. And and then uh, saw that actualized. And, and so that was, that was a huge day. And then the other thing that I knew, I, I read Atlas Shrugged when I was 16 and I knew that I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I knew that someday I would start a company. And, um, and so those are the two things that I was really sure about. That was an interesting insight into how driven Mike is. But also I love the bit when he says, I remember very distinctly that being a huge win because I, that was the first time I had really worked for many years on one singular goal and and then uh, saw that actualized. Do you remember when you worked on a singular goal and saw that goal actualize? I digress. So if reading Patriot Games got Mike into the Naval Academy, how does he remember becoming a jet fighter pilot? Because if you aren't aware, you can't just go to the Naval Academy and become a jet fighter pilot. The success that I never wanted, which was uh, getting to fly jets. I, uh, so after my Naval Academy experience, I said, I'm never going to be in the bottom again. I'm, I'm always going to be on the top now so that I can pick my own destiny. So I decided to graduate number one in my flight school class, which allows you to pick what aircraft you fly. So I worked really hard and got number one and got called into the CEO's office. And I, I told him, I want to go P3s, which is a big spy plane that is land-based. Right. And he said, nope, nope, the number one guy goes jets. <laughs> F-18s is basically um, what, what he was saying, which is the, uh, you know, not, to, not to say that one is better than the other, but you know, the elite performance is typically associated with the, with the fighter guys. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so going, going into the F-18 community ended up being... Um, the, the biggest success that I never wanted. And, and uh, it really changed my life going into that squadron and, and just seeing the way they operated. And, and I really felt at home for the first time.
Your instructor is one of the finest pilots this program has ever produced. His exploits are legendary. What he has to teach you may very well mean the difference between life and death. Your reputation precedes you. I have to admit, I wasn't expecting an invitation back. They're called orders, Maverick. If you've been living on Mars, that is the beginning of the trailer to Top Gun Maverick out in cinemas June 26th. And no, this volume isn't sponsored by Top Gun. But if that does not excite you for the next 20 minutes of this volume, I'm sorry, I can't do much more than Jet Fighters. Even in the first minute of the Maverick trailer, it highlights orders. The orders. The orders make it hard for some people to function in. Actually, most people find it hard to do anything because they are ordered to do it. I got to the Naval Academy and I found out that it was not the right place for me and that uh, I had a really hard time following arbitrary rules that, that, that didn't make any sense. Now, uh, that doesn't mean I'm just a rebel. If I can understand the rule, understand why it's in place, then I have no problem following it. But if, if it seems arbitrary... For whatever reason, that just becomes very difficult for me to to follow those rules. So I, I raged against the man at the Naval Academy and took the uh, took the hard way through, and, uh, battling the powers that be, and and realized that that's a losing battle. Ladies and gentlemen, do you know why that is a losing battle? Because there is a philosophy behind the rules. You have to be trained to take orders. The idea, the philosophy behind the, these rules at the Naval Academy is that you must learn to follow before you can lead. Uh, and, and I think that's true to, to some extent. But, but what are you following? Do you need to learn to blindly accept what's given to you by your superiors? I don't, I don't think so. I don't think that's learning leadership or followership. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, so I just have a problem with that, that philosophy in general. But I made it through by the skin of my teeth. And uh, I managed to graduate. And that was another very happy day because I, A, uh, it was another huge accomplishment, but B, I knew I would be free from, from those rules and uh, I was excited about the future. I remember being excited about something, thinking that I deserve it, walking into it with the I know it all attitude and then getting a harsh reality check. Like when I used to have a job, it was a while ago, but I remember getting the job and feeling like I deserved it feeling like I had so much to contribute and that I was confident that I could help. Turned up on day one trying to look for problems to fix so that I could feel like I was contributing. It has happened to me more than once. I was metaphorically told to shut the fuck up, new guy. And if I removed my hurt ego out of the equation, I shouldn't have opened my mouth to begin with. So I had maybe a little bit of reversed imposter syndrome. Uh, I showed up to the squadron after two and a half years of flight school and after four years of the Naval Academy, this, this, this huge battle. And I showed up, you know, in my crisp white uniform, ready to go take on the world. And I really had this feeling like I have arrived and I, I showed up to the squadron and, and walked up to the first person I saw and said, Hey, I'm, I'm Mike Brown. I'm checking in today. And he just looked me right in the face and said, shut the fuck up, new guy. And I was, I was taken aback. I was like, whoa, that's weird. And so I walked to the next person and, and this uh, was a female and she looked at me and said the exact same thing. Shut the fuck up, new guy. And, and they do that for a reason. It's because, uh, you know, I had this attitude that I thought I'd made it and I, I knew things and I'm, I'm smart and funny and I'm going to come in here and, and change things. And you're not allowed to talk in a fighter squadron for the first six months unless you're asking a question. That's the rule. 
I don't want to hear your opinions. I don't want to hear how smart and funny you are. If you're asking a question, you can open your mouth. Otherwise, sit there and shut the fuck up. And that really bothered me at first. I was like, oh no, I'm back here in this Naval Academy arbitrary rule environment. But what I realized is you don't know what you don't know. And, and that was a really valuable lesson. Uh, after three or four months, I started realizing, oh, oh, I've got a lot to learn. And when the six month mark came and I was, I was finally allowed to open my mouth, I realized that maybe I better shut the fuck up for another six months. Uh, so, uh, if, if there, if there is any imposter syndrome, uh, in, in that story, you know, it's, it's almost feeling like once you've done the training, you've made it. Uh, and so, being humbled again and starting as a, as a beginner and, and with a beginner's mind, I think was a really valuable tool. And then, and then it allowed me to, to learn and, and be taught uh, by these really incredible mentors and get the lesson without feeling like I don't belong because I knew that I'd, I'd paid my dues. Did you know that company founders were 125% more successful if they had previously worked in a similar industry as their new companies? That is an insane lesson. I learned so much humility from just understanding this rule. The rule that before you change anything, understanding why and how things work currently. Listen before you speak. Plan before you execute. Train before you race. The lessons are everywhere and we ignore them all, looking to speak, execute and race because they make us look good, maybe. Could we extrapolate the good things into a business environment? Probably. Because I do feel like a lot of us get into business like the new guy. And anyone can start a business. So the failure comes when you can't keep the business going. But that isn't the end of the world. You live to fight another day in business. But for a jet fighter pilot, failure in the field is death. How do you prepare and plan and train and listen before you go up in the sky, Mike? To break down a, a, a typical high-level uh, exercise uh, flight in the Navy, uh, we might plan for, for eight to ten hours, uh, brief for two hours, fly for an hour and a half, and then come back and debrief for four hours. So the amount of time that you're putting in on the ground in, in preparation and then analysis vastly dwarfs the time you actually spend in the air executing the mission. So I think if you take that mindset to, to business and, and, um, so, so we spend an inordinate amount of time planning, uh, our strategies and, and strategizing and, and, um, almost creating these if then scenarios and really kind of deep diving the rabbit hole because in the air, when, when you're fighting, you don't have time to think about, what the next decision is going to be. It has to be muscle memory. It has to be so ingrained in your brain that your body just reacts immediately to counter whatever move your adversary uh, implements. And uh, we kind of think of the same way in executing a business. If we can say, hey, if A happens, then we're going to execute B. And if, and if this happens, we're going to go this direction. And if you can really go down that rabbit hole and plan those things out in real time, you'll always know what to do. You'll always have a plan. And and, and look, sometimes the plan has to go out the window, but, but generally, if you've thought through the scenarios beyond just a couple of steps, uh, you show up and you just execute on a much different level. I know that I used to not think about the different scenarios because I was too scared to think about them even as being possibilities. But they are important. Again, Mike, could we actually implement this and have you implemented this in your oil and gas company you know certainly there's a there's a kinder gentler way to do it and in, in today's corporate culture uh, you might not have a lot of people work for you if you tell them to shut the fuck up when they when they come in the door but what what we've asked people to do in, in our organization is hey look um, come here and for the first six months learn all of our processes and if you if you don't like them that's fine take notes on it and, and bring it to me after six months. What I don't want is you coming in and a month later be like, hey, I think I've got a better way to do this tracker. Fine, you may have the best way ever, 
But what I want you to do is really learn our process. And, and then if you still think that you've got a great solution, then, then bring it to them when you have an informed opinion as opposed to just firing off the cuff. Because generally, uh, these processes are in place for a reason, right? And, and the people that are more experienced than you put these in a place because of something that happened. And you may not be privy to that. Once you gain that understanding and you say, no, I, I still think it's a better way, then it's going to be a genuinely great improvement typically. And I, w- I want that feedback. I want, I want to hear you, you know, improve uh, your processes, but I want it to be from an informed place. I love it. By the way, Mike has successfully exited his very successful and highly profitable oil and gas company since I spoke with him almost a year ago in Boulder, Colorado. When we come back, how does money affect our personalities? Not when we have no money, but when we have all the money we need. The main objective of this audio project is to bring together entrepreneurs and creatives who share similar values in a place where conversation can be had without judgment. A place where our listeners can give us constructive feedback to improve this show with topic and guest recommendations. For access to full-length interviews and access to that place, go to mustamplify.com slash poe and click the button. Before the break, reverse imposter syndrome, shut the fuck up, new guy, and extrapolating lessons from flight school. Now I was getting into some real phenomenal conversation about extrapolating lessons from being a jet fighter pilot, especially the benefits of in-depth risk management and problem solving. You just have to start uh, finding value in the process. Um, And and there's, there's plenty of times where you plan... You, know, you always want to plan worst case scenarios out. Okay, well, uh, what if this happens and then this happens and then this happens? And like, what's the reality of that ever happening? It's, it's very low, right? But, but the value comes in thinking through how you're going to get out of that scenario. And then when only one of those things happens, it doesn't seem like a very big deal. It's not an emergency. You've only got one problem. If you had three compounding problems, well, now things start to get stressful. But because you've already talked about it, when you only have one problem, it's, it's a pretty easy fix. It is a pretty easy fix. I suppose it feels like an easy fix because of the reps that you put in. Right, Mike? For a brief, for example, um, you, know, you might have to, to talk for an hour and a half uh, on the entire flight, all of these different elements of, of the enemy and, and our tactics. And, and uh, a lot of people might rehearse the brief once. And, and generally it goes, it goes pretty well. And then, you know, a few guys might rehearse it twice. Uh, and, and what I found is that if you rehearse four or five times where on the fifth time it starts to get really painful, by the time you're delivering that, that brief, um, the execution is just at at such a high level that that extra work shows because you, you've gotten the reps in. Right. And so I I think that the same is true of businesses before we're going to launch a new campaign or, or, you know, new process. Uh, we really sit with it and, and rehearse it and, and talk through all of the scenarios, um, you know, again, so that when it comes up, it's not the first time we're seeing it. That, that's really, I think, the most important thing is that uh, if your brain's at least had a chance to process uh, something beforehand, you're going to make better decisions in the moment. Do you remember when Mike told us about when he showed up to the squadron? And I, I showed up to the squadron and, and walked up to the first person I saw and said, hey, I'm, I'm Mike Brown. I'm checking in today. And he just looked me right in the face and said, shut the fuck up, new guy. And I was, I was taken aback. I was like, whoa, that's weird. And so I walked to the next person and, and this uh, was a female. And she looked at me and said the exact same thing. Shut the fuck up, new guy. 
I bet that must have felt hard to listen to. Maybe for some of you. It was for me. But all those things adds up to less people dying in the sky, I suppose. But what was the greatest tool Mike thought the fighter squadron could give us to discern performance? The greatest tool, I think, in the fighter squadron for discerning performance is debrief. Uh, it's something that I think is, is very overlooked in today's culture, which is look back at, at what just happened and how can we improve? And, you know, in the fighter squadron, we don't talk about what you did well. That's just expected. But we like to say that we thrive on criticism. And so every time we get back from a flight, we might spend the next two and a half hours talking about all the different little nuances. And, and there's no such thing as a perfect flight. And, and it almost becomes a game to try and, and see how well you can do and then come back. And then you're almost just, just begging for the criticism to see where you can improve for the next one. And uh, I, think, I think creating that environment really allows people to, to be their best because they get immediate feedback. They're, they're given uh, next steps in, in order to improve. So they, so they walk away knowing exactly what they have to do in order to show up the next time even better. Even better. Even better. Even better. Do you know what you got to do to show up the next time even better? Do you? Mike? Really, it's, it's been kind of the journey through entrepreneurship, starting to, to listen to podcasts and, and read business books. And uh, I, started, I started hearing a lot about this meditation thing and uh, everyone's doing it, so I, I, I better start doing it too. And um, uh, I, I've always been very interested in, in consciousness and, and how the brain works. And so, so reading stuff um, by guys like Sam Harris and Jonathan Haidt really made me start kind of going down the self-discovery path. And, and uh, I found it to be really rewarding to, to have to sit and think about the things um, that maybe you don't want to or, or maybe you're too scared to. Um, and, you know, it's, it's certainly difficult work, uh, but, but the, the gains that you get on the backside of overall uh, satisfaction and happiness, I, I think, are just are so worth it. You know, so, so maybe the impetus was the fact that I had always been checking boxes my whole life and I, I was always meeting the successes that I laid out for myself and achieving these goals. And I found out that what happens then when you've achieved all the things that you set out to do, then what? If that doesn't fill you up, what are you going to do? There was certainly a period of time where I was beating myself up saying, you, you have no right to not be satisfied. You have everything that you set out to do uh, and, and, you know, how dare you not be satisfied with everything that you have. And, and, and maybe satisfied is not the right word, but, you know, uh, it was all of this stuff and all of this success was supposed to, to fill me up. And um, it turns out that, that it, it just created different problems, but it, but it didn't fill the cup, right? And so... The good news is, is that that kind of allowed me to take a step back and get off the treadmill and say, okay, it's not going to be the next car. It's not going to be the next deal. It's not going to be the next metric in the business that makes me happy because none of these first five did. So now saying, okay, well, my, you know, I, I wanted to break eight figures in revenue and, and then we hit that. So is the next goal nine figures? Well, if the eight figure goal didn't, didn't do what I thought it was going to do, why would the next one? And, uh, and I think some people never get off that train. And, uh, so I feel very fortunate that, that I kind of realized that setting more arbitrary goals wasn't going to, to fix whatever the hole was inside. Many successful CEOs and business leaders use meditation to increase clarity and creativeness. Among a range of positive benefits that can be achieved through this practice, Meditation has also proven to be an effective way for leaders to cope with anxiety, stress, and anger, as well as build a better work environment. So here's the deal. Mike drives this insanely beautiful car and has a bunch of them. And here is what's really interesting. I see people interact with Mike before and after they know the car he drives. It's in the small comments that I notice, like... Hey, Mike, did you rent a car to come see us? And they might seem like small jabs, but it's quite interesting to see how people react to the fact that Mike is really successful. 
I think he gets it so often that he just smiles through it. Money amplifies personalities. You know, if, if someone was an asshole before they got money, it's really going to show up once they have the ability to do whatever they want. Uh, and conversely, uh, you know, if someone had a very generous heart before uh, they achieve financial success, that's going to come out when they have those resources and, and how they, uh, they spend their money. And so, you know, for, for me, uh, money has always represented the ability to take care of the things that I care about. That's what I think the ultimate purpose of money is, is to be able to affect the things that, that matter to you. And, and so after achieving that degree of financial success, uh, you know, I had, I had posters of cars on my wall and I wanted to buy cars and, and, and I did that for a little while. And again, kind of like the million dollar thing, it felt really, really good to buy a badass car for the first time and, and drive around. But the second one didn't feel any better. Uh, in fact, it just kind of became another thing. Um, and, and, you know, everybody probably goes through this to some degree is, you know, you, people that, that say, oh, you know, I would, I would never want that stuff. Well, it's really pretty fucking fun to, to get to buy it, but it's very ephemeral. It's, it's fleeting and it, and it, and it feels good only right in the moment. And, and almost immediately after it just becomes the new standard, right? And that's this lifestyle creep, uh, that, that you hear about. And, and I was, and still am susceptible to that, uh, of elevating that standard. Lifestyle creep. <laughs> we all have it. Rochelle keeps me grounded because I'm a fool when it comes to spending money. What is your relationship with money? Have you ever considered looking at that? Mike? So I think that taking stock of, of your relationship to money, what I realize is that the negative side of money uh, has been the ability to procrastinate. Uh, you know, uh, uh, money has been somewhat of a crutch for me in I have traditionally done my best work under huge pressure. And, and at the beginning, when we started our company, I got, I got down to $2,000 in my checking account. And that was the last bit of money I had in my name. And when the pressure was on, we got our first deal done. And that's been a pattern that we've seen show up in, in our business. And, and so I would almost have to create these high pressure situations for myself in order to, to elicit my best performance. Once I kind of got enough money, I couldn't create that situation anymore because nothing was ever so dire that I had to go in and perform. And, uh, and so, you know, that was a pattern that served me for a lot of years. It served me in the fighter squadron. It kept me alive. It served me in, in the beginning of our company because it, it, elicited that high performance, but now that's a pattern that's not serving me because, uh, trying to create dire situations, uh, in order to perform is not a pattern that, that I need to put myself through going forward. So having to relearn, uh, how to, to create those work habits, uh, has been, has been a huge challenge. Speaking of relationships towards money, do you remember when David Meltzer said this in volume five? Uh, I used to attach everything to to an end to a happiness. When I'm rich, I'll be happy. When first million dollars, when I buy my Ferrari, I'll be happy. When I buy my motorhome, I'll be happy. When I buy my mom's house, I'll be happy. When I get married, I'll be happy. When I have my children, when they graduate high school, I'll be no, not anymore. It's to me, I am happy on the pursuit of my potential. So maybe you might be thinking, wait, if he's so successful, why take a break? The first reason is that uh, I feel like that we've achieved all the goals that we wanted to with, with this particular company. And I promised myself uh, that w when we started it, I promised that once I hit a certain number that I would uh, retire and, and take a break and travel the world for a while. And that number came and went and we never did it. And so um, some of the clarity that I received this weekend was that I need to take that break. This bit here, for me, is the best learning from the whole conversation. It is about cadence. People go there looking for different things. And for me, I was seeking what I was going to start next and what I was going to do next. And this has been a question that's consumed me for 18 months, probably. Just, just thinking about, um, you know, almost kind of a Spider-Man with, with great power comes great responsibility. And, and I've been successful 
uh, enough at this company that now I have the the freedom of time and money. And and so with that responsibility, uh, I just felt this incredible pressure to, st- to start something new and to start something great that, that helps people and that fills up my soul. And I do still believe all of those things. You know, I, I have um, great talents and I have a lot to offer this world. And, and so I, I think there is some level of responsibility to uh, try and leave it better than you found it and, and, and help people that haven't had the same opportunities that I have. Uh, but I also think that uh, I know that, that cadence is really important as well. And, and right now, I think that taking some time off to kind of think about what that looks like rather than forcing it and rather than jumping right into the next thing is, is the right thing for me. And, and so the sessions this weekend uh, really just gave me permission to, to come to the answer that I already knew, which was that I want to travel with my family for a few months or a year. See, maybe because I'm a recovering runner and that I understand cadence because I'm a runner, but it is in the case with anything I dissect. If you can find cadence, which, by the way, has many definitions, um, rhythmic flow of a sequence of sounds or words, the regular rise and fall of the voice, the human voice, or even a set of chords at the end of a piece of music, here is how I'd like you to think about it. Everything has rhythm. If you can find your rhythm with the things you do regularly, your reps, you will achieve cadence. Once you have any cadence, however slow it is to begin with, it allows you to get faster in the long run. And in 2020, my team and I will be looking to explore just that on this show. Psychology of Entrepreneurship. Coming up on The Psychology of Entrepreneurship. Who's working for us? What's their why? What's our why? why? Why are we actually doing this? You have to understand through multiple conversations from multiple directions to understand what is fair. You know, anyone doing any business, any creating anything, if you get hit with some resistance, which you will, and you fold, then you already know. You don't have the deepest why that you need. So take that on. So it's all about every opportunity to investigate the opportunity Uh, unfortunately the the sad part of the industry is you can sell that stuff and it's selling all over the place anyone grieving anything i would just say don't try to push it away just face it straight on psychology of entrepreneurship This is a Must Amplify production. Special thanks to every guest expert that has appeared on the show. Editing and sound design by Kelly Bonniman, Joel Thomas, and Nemanja Bakovic. Voiceovers by Kelly Bonniman. Guest research and content by Claire Gould and Corinne Castles. Project managed by Shannon Morrison. Produced and hosted by me, Ron Sleepers. For more episodes and where to listen, go to mustamplify.com slash P-O-E. Hey, Hey, it's Kaylee from Must Amplify. I'm the sound engineer for this volume of Psychology of Entrepreneurship. I'm a part of the team that made this production come alive. Our team consists of members from all around the globe, with our headquarters based in West End, Brisbane, Australia, the land of the drop bear. For more about the cool stuff that we're up to and to work out of our studios, head to mustamplify.com. Are you still listening? Here's our little gift to you for sticking around. It's a pretty easy fix. I suppose it feels like an easy... F- huh? By the way, Mike has successfully exited this... My mouth isn't open. Does psychology have a pee? No, it doesn't. Uh, <laughs> it does. Uh, it has a pee, doesn't have a purr. <laughs>